have a touch the pad. Used. Now then, crew, and welcome back to the Andy Mechanic YouTube channel. Finally, after what seems many, many months, we get back on the tools. Now, you may remember, a few a couple of years ago, I did a video, an autopsy video, on a Honda Jazz engine that had covered 75,000 kilometers without an oil change, or even oil top-up. Obviously, the, you know, the inevitable happened, and finally, the oil level got to a critical point where the, the engine just failed. And that video is about an hour and a half long, and it covers the entire strip down where we inspect each component and we find the primary fail. So, we now have, I've been given, another engine. This one is from the infamous Suzuki LT300 King Quad. Now, these are available from sort of, I think, very late 80s, 89, 90. I could be, I could be wrong. And uh, what I like about these engines is they have 15 forward gears and three reverse gears and it's out of a quad bike what the hell 15 forward gears so it's got a, a five speed gearbox it's got high so you've got five gears in high it's got low so you've got five gears in low and then you've got super low it's got another five gears in super low. So it's got like a little splitter box or a range change thing and it's got the main gearbox. Now, the customer was driving this or riding this quad bike at full tilt down a tarmac road, giving it full beans on the stop, nailing it. Say what you like. Any phrase you want, he was going as fast as this quad bike would go. And it stopped. It stopped very, very quickly. Basically, the engine seized up, so he said. Now, being a customer, he left it a while, didn't check anything, and it started again. But it only had drive in the super low range. And I'm not sure if all the gears, all the five gears, are available in that range either. But anyway, he took it to a dealer, and the dealer said, look, there's no oil in the engine, it's going to be junk, it's not worth us pulling it apart, we'll just find you a good second-hand engine. And we'll put it in your quad bike, and away you go. So that's exactly what happened. This engine hasn't been touched, it's just been taken out of the frame, and it was chucked on a scrap heap, and I spotted it. And I thought, hey up, I've got a video right there, and it's going to make some really interesting footage, as did the last autopsy on an engine we did. But with this one... Different to the Jazz, we've got the engine, you know, cylinder, crankshaft, and so on. Then we've also got an integral gearbox. And, believe it or not, it's got an integral final drive as well. It's all one big lump. There's going to be heaps of stuff to look at. Okay, well, I was told off in the last video, Andy, you ramble on so much. I do. So, without further ado, we've got the old Makita. So, no, no air tools on this one. We'll crack on and we'll make a start pulling it apart. Now I also do have the official Suzuki service manual for this engine, I hope. So, as we get further into it, we'll maybe start taking a look at the manual and work out what's what. I'd like to find out why an engine seizure would cause, you know, a top end seizure would also cause damage inside the gearbox. Now we know there's lack of lubrication, so that's what we're looking for, telltale signs of what components and bearings have, have got seriously damaged because they haven't been lubricated. That's why it's really important not just to do your oil changes, but it's also really important to check your oil on a regular basis because every single engine on the planet does use a little tiny bit of oil. And if you don't check it, that oil level will be going down. Now sure, some people say, oh, it goes up, Andy, because it gets you know petrol in the oil and contaminants. Well, it does, but the, the quality of the oil goes down, and some engines burn it faster than the, the petrol gets in, so the level does actually drop down. But you must do your oil changes, people, otherwise it just destroys what could well be a really good little engine. been working hard for you for years and years and years, 
give it some love. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> now, I am just experimenting with a bit of lighting. So we've got a little fluorescent tube sat just under the camera. So hopefully you can see a lot better because this is the new workshop and we're still playing around with the lights and stuff. Okay, let's take a look. So we're going to start at the top. Let's get the cylinder strip first and pretty standard kind of single cylinder four stroke engine. We're going to pull off, uh, knowing Suzuki, uh, this cover here will also retain the camshaft. So let's see if we can get in there and take a look. See if the camshaft had any damage because of the lack of oil. Now there may still be a little bit of oil in this engine. We'll find out. I know the final drive oil was still in it because it's all over the back of the Ute now. It was. I cleaned it up. Okay. Now this engine is not going to go back together, so don't worry about oh, oil. Excellent. Don't worry about the uh, procedure. If you're going to rebuild one of these. There is a, a set procedure in, the, in which order you would take these bolts out. I'm not too concerned because it's going to go in the scrap bin. Well, that's bent. Jeez. Okay. Hang on. It's, uh, it's obviously been thrown around a bit, this engine, once it was taken out because that's your decompression lever. And, uh, well, there we go. Look. It's out. That bolt was holding it in. Brilliant. Okay. I do like these new Makita tools we got. I've had this one about a year now. It's doing really, really well. Right. Hopefully. Ooh, it smells. It smells pretty burnt, actually. Okay, we're going to need the magic hammer to dislodge that top cover. Perfect. Benjamin hadn't stolen it this time. There we go. Now, are all the bolts out? Yes, they are. Okay. You need to have a close-up. Jeez. Right, now I'm not too sure whether you can see or not. Hopefully you can. I'll do a really super close-up in a minute. But you can see, we'll just pull this cover off. This rocket cover. And you can see that the cover itself provides the bearing surface for the camshaft. This is the camshaft. We've got two lobes. And it went on that way. So, this lobe is the exhaust. And this lobe is for the intake valve and you can see inside there look these little rockers uh, you see that bit that uh, that heel runs on the camshaft lobe here and we've got the adjustable tappet at this end which basically sits on top of the valve okay you adjust that so you can get your valve clearances right it's dead easy what concerns me is all this water you see these little blobs in the oil we've got water quite a lot of water around inside this engine so that could be a telltale sign. There's even some down here on the bench too. Right, let's get rid of that for now. It doesn't look like, actually, before we do, are there any score marks? Remember, the engine ran out of oil. That's what we were told by the customer. Well, the rockers haven't seized, which is good. And if we look at the heel, usually a telltale sign is this, this heel here will start to have score marks. It'll have broken through the case hardening, the hardened surface of that rocker. And the same with the valve. So we'll do a real good close-up and we'll look at the actual um, the lobes on the camshaft and we'll see if there's any scoring on there. I'm going to really upset the camera now. There you go. So you've got a very good super close-up of the heel of each of those rockers. Now if I find my little rag, I'll just clean off the crap. Now it's probably going to go out of focus for a second but it's pretty good at coming back. There we go. Okay, if I just bring those back up. Now, can we see any scoring on those surfaces? Well, not really. There's some slight wear. This is an old machine, don't forget. It's going to have some, so they're in very good nick. If I run the screwdriver across the surface, again, now, nah, they're, they're actually mint. 
big concern water in the oil at the moment okay now what about the lobes let's give those a little bit of a clean yes we're getting rid of the water I know so we'll look at this one first now this one did geez which one was it now this one does the intake this one does the exhaust that's right that's the looks of it okay so again a good a good trick is just to run your screwdriver across the surface and you'll be able to feel straight away if there's wear on the surface of that uh, that lobe actually it's really really good now maybe I can I can just turn it on the flywheel so let's just see if we can get it back a little bit and we'll look at this other oh it doesn't feel good that's as far as I can get it now again we've got some more water here look just running off the side of that low right again nope super smooth but I don't think the camshaft has actually been affected by the oil again these journals here these run straight into the aluminium and as soon as they're down on oil these will soon start to pick up so if we look back in the uh, in the rucker cover we can see in there look again is that scored it's not it's not scored at all neither neither's that one they're in very very good condition so the top end of this engine doesn't look like it's been starved of oil at all weird doesn't really go along the lines of what the customer thought had happened or the guy that took the engine out to be honest okay right now we can't get the camshaft out because the cam chain is tight so the next job is to remove the cam chain adjuster and that's mounted on the cylinder so time for a time to move the camera I think right the cam chain adjuster is located down here and this one will be a ratchet with a spring inside so as the cam chain wears the spring takes up it pushes the plunger in takes up the tension so we can pull out the spring first that'll be on this little bolt here and be careful of taking these out because it will go between there we go look <laughs> almost did right a little spring and there's a little insert push rod inside there as well you see that cool okay now we're going to need a number five allen key to undo these so just bear with me a second there we go that should fit perfect right let's get that slapped on here we go now they're not normally too tight of those usually about uh, 10 newton meters I would say will be the spec if you're putting that back in again always check the manual but I'm only going from a generic here we go two bolts and now give it a little tap just to break the gasket seal there we go if you give them a tap, sometimes you can save the gasket, which we have done now, which is no use to me whatsoever. So if you want a gasket, it's right there for you. And you can see here, this is the ratchet. So to release the ratchet, you just push down on there, and that'll slide back in again. And then, that's how you'd fit it. And then once it's fitted, you put the spring back in, like this. And you'll see that as I push the spring, obviously this now would be against the slipper inside the head. As you push the spring, you see, look, it pushes it out. And the little ratchet pole there holds it in place so you can't push it back. Sometimes those poles can wear and these can keep moving in and out. And that creates a hell of a chatter on your cam chain because it's loose. Right, where's the end piece? I'll put it all back together because you never know. The top end might be good. And if it is, some, one of you out there might want the top end of this engine. There we go, look. Right, you can see if I hold that pole now, it's under spring pressure. And I can't push it back in when the pole's in place. That's how it should be. So that's in pretty good neck. Okay, so we should now have full slack on that cam chain. So we'll just give it a bit of a... You see there, look, it can be lifted off the sprocket. So we should now have a bit of, bit of movement on there. Hopefully. Some engines, you've got to take the actual sprocket off the camshaft and... I don't want to be doing that. Not at the moment. Yep, that's pulling back, so that's good. 
Don't tell me Suzuki want me to undo those bolts. I think they do, don't they? Jeez. Okay, well, we're going to have to knock those tabs over and pull those bolts out. And that's going to take the sprocket off the end of the camshaft. Most bizarre. Normally they come off quite easy. There we go. Hopefully I can get in with a punch and you can see what's going on. So we can get to that one down there. One more bit. That's that one. I think that should be enough. Then we'll give this one a go. I'm going to need to move it around a bit, chap. Sorry. There we go. Now, I should make a start with the old screwdriver. Sorry, Tang. Hey, torchy. Okay, 10 mil. That looks a bit. So we can get that one off. one. Now it's important if you just do your top end not to drop bolts down into the crankcase. That usually doesn't go down too well with your boss normally. Just turn the crank around a bit. Still a bit of compression there. What's going on? Can we get it at that point? Oh, just. Right, that's the other bolt out. Stick that in there. Now we need to get this little locking plate out. We don't want to drop that down there. That's that gun. You guys still see okay? You can. Perfect. Now we can take that and spin it around again. Should be able to see even better now. There we go. So now we should be able to take that off the end of the camshaft. Take the camshaft out. There we go. Oh, that's a little little locator for the camshaft. I'll show you that in a second. Let's get rid of the sprocket. That's that gone. You've got your timing marks on there. Right in there. And we'll just let the cam chain sit down there. Now, that little half moon piece just sits in there like that. What that does is it locates the camshaft longitudinally. It can't, you know, it basically stops it from moving from side to side, which is obviously critical. You know, it's got to be located properly, otherwise you, you know, you've got a cam chain running on a sprocket. Your drive lines are going to change if that starts floating around. So if you're assembling one of these, you've got to make sure that that's in place. It's an easy thing to forget. Ah, come back. There we go. Right, stick that in there. One last little look at the old camshaft. Now it's out. That looks pretty good. There is some very slight scoring I can see on here. You might be able to hear that. The lobes look good. This one looks fine. Again, this one's got slight scoring, but don't forget this end's got quite a bit more loading without having the sprocket on it. The cam chain's pulling hard against it, pulling it down towards the crank. Now, what about the head? Usually, if anywhere's going to score up, it's going to be it's going to be these bearings here because it's only aluminium. You know, it's straight into the aluminium. Obviously, there's an oil supply. Yeah, just a minor score down there. Look, not bad at all. Certainly serviceable. No problems at all with that. Okay, well, next step is to remove the cylinder head. Perfect. Always a fun bit to do. Ah, more water. Look, look at this. Jeez. What if he's been drowning it in a creek or something? Now, the cylinder head, it's only a small engine, don't forget, 300, well, 280 cc's actually. We've got head bolts, we've got one, so these are, these will be big long studs that come out of the crankcase, so we've got a nut there, another one here, 
one here and one here. Now, we could go and look at the manual, but these really, you should undo them in a diagonal fashion. So we could start here, do this one, then do this one, and then do this one. If you want to be really pedantic, you can just loose them off slowly and work your way, continue to work your way around in that diagonal fashion so you don't warp the head. Unlikely on a small head like this. Now, there's one thing that could catch you out. Before we undo these, if you look around the side of the engine, which is quite heavy, I'm going to move the camera for you. Do, 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 do. There you go, perfect. We've got under here two M6 studs, and they're studs in the head, and they, they go downwards and they go through the barrel, the cylinder of the bike, of the engine, and then there's some 10 millimeter bolts or nuts down this end. We need to loosen those off first. The last thing you want to do is undo the head bolts, the main head bolts, and all the tension be hanging off these little studs. You could easily cause some damage. So all we need for these is a 10mm spanner. We'll crack those off now. Now, again, this shouldn't be over tight. <laughs> That's one. Two. Easy. And we can just whiz those nuts off. One, two, right. Now we can do the head bolts. Just before we do, I want to pull out the spark plug while the head's still held for me. So I'll buzz that out. Okay, let's just take a little look at what the spark plug has to say. Well, it's a little bit wet. There's a bit of rust on it. Looks a very new spark plug as well, like somebody's tried to fix the engine by putting a new spark plug in. And maybe it's correct, maybe it's not, but it's a D8EA that uh, found its way into this engine. Could be the right one, might not be. Don't know without looking it up. Hmm. Okay, well I'm a bit concerned about the rust. But again, this engine might have been sat around for a while after it was taken out of the quad bike. Okay, head bolts. Right, so we do these diagonally, didn't we? Did it properly. So, sorry for the earthquake. I'm just going to use a ratchet for these. Okay, that's that one. That's that one. Definitely tight enough. That's that one. And last but not least, we've got the leverage. Oh, that one's tight. Holy moly. There we go. Cool. Right, so we'll buzz those out with our little rattle gun now. Now again, it looks... Oh, it's oil. There's oil underneath the nuts. Okay. Now these are all loose now, so no need to worry about the order that we're undoing them. And each one has a washer underneath the nut. So the washers are still in place on these two. There we go. Okay, let's see if we can just get those washers out. Feels pretty. There we go. This obviously hasn't been apart for a while. Sorry, Torchy, you're in the way. Where's my other screwdriver? See if we can just get under there. Look. There we are. That's that one. We really want two small screwdrivers, really. I can't be bothered to get the other one. Is that one? I'm not sure if these are copper washers or not, to be honest. There's a lot of copper colour there. Probably is. Keep the oil in. It creates a seal. Okay, right. It's four washers, four nuts. Put them on the recycle pile. 
Okie dokie. Okay, well we can split that head. Time to move the camera again. Okay, magic hammer. Now normally you've got to give these a little bit, little bit of a tap just to break the head gasket. Sorry about the earthquake. We've got the camera mounted on the same bench today, which is not normal. There we go. Great stuff. Okay, well, what can we see? We see some more rust. It's quite a big chamber. Combustion chamber, isn't it? Pretty, pretty low compression engine, probably. Well, the valves seem to all be intact. They're not burnt out or anything. But again, there are some... Where's Torchy? There you are. Look, can you see better? There are some rust lines or marks around here. Now that's the intake. So, has it been sat out in the rain with the manifold off and rainwater's gone in through the intake? Most likely. Yeah, not good. Not good at all. But still, so clean up. you can clean it up and reuse it. You might need to lap the valves in though because of the corrosion. Okay, I will put the cylinder head over there. Put it up, just sat on those studs. Now, next job is to get rid of the barrel. Before we do, we can inspect the cylinder. So we can wind the piston down to BDC, bottom dead center, and take a look and just see how bad that bore is. Because remember, this reportedly, this bike, or this engine seized up may well not be a cylinder seizure. It could be big ends, it could be, sorry, big end, it could be main bearings, it could be a transmission seizure. We just don't know until we get in there. That's what makes these things so much fun, digging our way in. Okay, we can get rid of that other slider now, that other slipper, there we go. And again, there's signs of emulsification in the oil. It's slightly white. And there's actually blobs of water running down in the oil. That's not good. Remember this is an air-cooled engine, there shouldn't be any water anywhere near this machine. Oh dear, that does not look good at all, does it? Okay, well, we've got a ton of rust down here. I'm going to find out if this engine was parked up or just chucked in the yard and it was sat there for months because this is not good at all. Obviously that wasn't there when the engine was running because it would have just got scraped away by the piston. Okay, well can we can we get it to bottom dead centre? Now when you're doing this, you've got to keep the cam chain tight, otherwise it can bind up on the on the sprocket on the crankshaft. So we'll just see if we can move it around a bit. There we go. Tell me when we're at the bottom. That feels quite bottomish to me. Uh, can I see? Can I see? Still going down. There we go. Bottom dead center. Right. Let's take a look. Okay, I've got torture, whether that's going to help or not. Now, is it scored? So we can run our screwdriver across the cylinder before we clean it up. I feel too bad to be honest. And the other side's pretty good too. Okay, well I think what we'll do, rather than wait, waste too much time looking at it now, let's get the cylinder taken off the crankcase. So we've got two more bolts just down the side. If I sneak around there, look. There you go. We see we've got two more of these little tiny uh, M6 10mm spanner size that we need to release as well. So let's get those cracked off now, and then we should be able to break the gasket and get this uh, cylinder taken off. And then we can take a proper look because the piston will be out. There we go. One. Two. Excellent stuff. Get rid of those. Okay, we should be able to give it up. Where's my magic hammer gone? I'm always tidying up and everything's out of arm's reach. Okay, it's loose. Let's get this. Hookly duckly. Right, cam chain's gonna disappear down the hole. Give it a wiggle. And it should. 
he says, come off quite easily. There we go. Okay, so the piston's going to pop out the bottom, just down here. Fantastic. It's probably just caught on the gasket a little bit. Ah, an O-ring. Let's get rid of that one. There we go. Don't need that anymore. Perfect. And there is some oil. Okay. Let's just pop the piston a bit further out so we can see what's going on there. Okay. Time for a bit of a close-up. Now, you're looking straight down at the piston and you can see the skirt. This part, this section here, this area of the piston is called the skirt. Now, these holes here, as this is thrashing up and down inside the crankcase, oil is thrown up on the underside of the piston and it comes out these holes here and lubricates the bore. So, if there's any problems with poor lubrication, a piston skirt is a really good telltale sign there's been an issue. Get that a bit of a clean off. And again, get our little screwdriver. And we're just going to run it across the surface. So we can feel the marks. I mean, we can see some minor scoring here on the piston, but it really is, it's very, very minor. And it's not deep. I can hardly feel that on the screwdriver at all. Rings, well, they're not seized in the piston. It hasn't been burning any oil. There's no carbon buildup in the oil scraper ring down here. Usually that's all gummed up when it's been burning oil. Sure, there's a, a little bit on top of the piston, but, you know, it's, this is an old machine. You'd expect that. Okay, well, we can pop the piston off. And to do that, we've got to take out a little clip. You've got the piston pin, or the gudgeon pin, inside that links the piston to the conrod. And at either end, there's little tiny clips. Now, maybe this screwdriver is just small enough. Now, I may not have left myself enough room to get the screwdriver in and the camera. But you can see, just in here, there's a little tiny circlip. I'm just going to see if we can dislodge it with this screwdriver. If not, I use a pick. Pick's my normal choice. There we go, she's coming. Now, these little circlips are a use once item. You cannot reuse them. There we go, so that's out. So that would have to go in the bin, even if you're gonna rebuild this engine. You know, it's, you've gotta use a new one. If one of these comes out while that piston's flapping up and down inside the cylinder, it's gonna cause some major carnage. Pretty fast demise. Now, with that circlip out, and there's or a little ring clip, there's one this side of the piston as well. You can take either one out, it makes no difference. Once one's out, you can push the pin usually through to the side that hasn't got the clip. There we go. Okay. And we'll just ease that out. I'm going to have to get it out with my fingers. It's usually quite slippy and super shiny. There we go. So that's the piston pin, or the gudgeon pin, we call that in England. So we'll stick that over there. And oh, look how clean that is. Beautiful little piston. Done ever so well. And this side here, look. Again, that was the top side that we looked at earlier on, I think. And this is the underside. And again, there's just no signs of scoring at all. And this, it looks like this piston was coated. I've no idea what the coating would be. Somebody might be able to tell us. Maybe a Teflon coating, I'm not sure. But you can see here, we've got a, you know, a bit of a coating on there. And on the skirt, it's just started to, well, it's just been wearing off slowly. Not a problem, just a feature. Wow. You can see again, you've got little holes here to help lubricate where the piston pin, gudgeon pin, runs in these bearings in here, look on the piston. It's all about lubrication, people. You've got to lubricate these engines, otherwise they go pop. Again, more water look. Definitely something going on with the water in this engine. Not good. 
but like I said before, none of the rings have seized in the piston. You can move those around quite easily. They're all loose in the piston, in the ring grooves. Take one of them off, look. What the hell? There we go. Bit of rust. Things are starting to rust because of that water. Not good. Okay, I'll we'll stick that to one side. And then we can look at some more stuff. Let's take a look down the cylinder. A bit more detail. Wow, that rust is just horrific, isn't it? So I think what I'll do is I'll clean that rust off and then we'll be able to have a good look at the actual cylinder wall and see if that's scored at all. But that's not good, is it? You don't want to see that on an engine. Jeez. Yeah, torch you can give us a hand. Now, just what's wrong with that piston, just going back before I put it in the parts box. Again, if there's been some scoring, sorry, never organised. You've got this section of the piston pin, or the gudgeon pin here, that runs in the conrod, on the little end on the conrod. And again, if there's been lack of lubrication, we'd often see marks and scoring around here. And there isn't any. It's all in really good condition. You can see there, look. So I'm very, very surprised. Not good. Not good at all. You know. I don't think we've had a, a top end. Well, I'm pretty certain from what I've seen so far, the piston has not seized in the bore. This could well be a transmission failure. Damn. Interesting, though. Right. Let's uh, get that bore cleaned out. Okay. Oh, I got some of this the other day, some brake cleaner. And I really don't like it. I think it's crap, in all honesty. It's nowhere near as good as the other cans of brake cleaner I've got over the years. It's got hardly any pressure in it. But brake cleaner should be like blasting its way out and you know. This thing just well, it's lucky if it even makes the surface that you're aiming at. Not impressed at, at all, to be perfectly honest. Maybe it's just a, a crap can, but I've had two cans so far that I've opened, used. And uh, both of them have been pretty shit. And that's quite a new can, that one. I haven't used it that much. Right, I can't get in any more on this side. That rusting really hasn't helped. Man, I think to do that would need to need to have been outside for a few weeks, really. So maybe it was. So maybe we've got to ignore the rust. Maybe even ignore the water. when it's all used up and we'll buy some proper stuff again. Wow. Yeah, there's some pretty bad rusting in there. Okay, let's take a slightly closer look. Okay, maybe a freehand would be better. We're going to go airborne. Bear with me, people. Okay. So a lot of reflection going on there, so... Maybe that's going to help a little bit. So you've got to ignore the rust. We're not looking at the rust. We're looking at the original ball. So the areas where there's no rust, does it look scored? Hmm. You see the cross hatchings right down the bottom of the cylinder. That's what it would have been like when it was brand new. It would have been like that all the way up. My apologies, it is hard to get the camera to focus on shiny surfaces. But to be honest, it really doesn't look too bad. If you ignore the rust, 
please ignore the rust because I don't believe that that's anything to do with the fail of this engine at this point in time I wonder if, I wonder if, I wonder if, just, just bear with me, an idea. Oof, why the camera like that? There you go, is that going to work? I don't see any scoring, I see it all shiny. Now, don't think that's an issue. Well, we've dug our way in so far. We've done the whole cylinder. The cylinder head, well, start with the camshaft, cylinder head, and of course the cylinder and the piston's off. And the piston shows no signs of bore seizure. And neither does the cylinder. I do not believe that this engine seized up due to an engine cylinder problem. Well, what else is left on the engine side before we get into the transmission? And it's a big transmission for a little quad bike. Well, we've got a crankshaft, and a crankshaft has a big end bearing. That's the conrod bearing that connects the conrod to the crankshaft, the web. And we've got main bearings. Possibly, it could be a big end failure, um, or it may well be um, you know, a main bearing failure. Unlikely, but it could be. It's got a potential. If those two are a pass, then it has to be something in the gearbox or possibly even the final drive. We'll find out. Okay, let's take a look at that big end. Right, now again, here is the conrod. Remember, this end of the conrod connects to the piston and the other end of the conrod, and it's called a conrod because it's a connecting rod. This end down here has a much larger bearing and this is called the big end bearing. And in England, we call this the little end bearing because we're pretty simple as mechanics. We try to look at things and give them names that match how they look. So little end bearing, big end bearing. Now, if the big end um, suffers from lack of lubrication, we would normally see bluing around the webs where the, piston, where, where the, uh, the pin, the crank pin, runs across. And there is no bluing whatsoever in this area. Even the conrod itself, there's no bluing on that part. I don't believe we had any problems at all with this big end. Now we can also check the bearing itself. Uh, sometimes they're a plain bearing, other times they're a shell bearing, like in that little Honda Jazz engine. Uh, and they can also be a needle roller bearing. Now, side to side movement, that's thrust going from one side to the other, you can see there's where's my screwdriver, there's quite a bit of a gap here and here, you've got these little thrust washers in there that's not a problem, don't worry about that at all, that's absolutely fine just ignore it the issue we're, at, we're looking for is if you get hold of the conrod and as you're looking at it now, is if I pull it towards the camera and push it away from the camera, I'm trying to feel any kind of movement and there shouldn't be any, it should be solid because you can imagine this thing's whacking up and down that cylinder at, I don't know, four, five, six thousand RPM. That piston's flying up to the top of the cylinder at a fair rate of knots, and it stops dead before it crashes into the cylinder head. And if there's play on here, then there's a chance that the piston crown, this part here, could actually make contact with the cylinder, uh, with the cylinder head, and that would be really, really bad. You'll hear a loud banging noise. And, things wouldn't last very long so you've got to check that there's no movement up and down on that bearing and I cannot feel anything side to side sure no problem but up and down nothing one last check I'm going to check for any kind of roughness in the movement of the bearing now we've got a can chain to worry about so hey up it's all right it's come off the sprocket we're all good so now we can just turn that around and I'm just feeling if there's any kind of notchiness and you'd see the, the actual conrod probably twitch on the end of your finger 
if it was binding. Man, it feels really good. No signs of overheating at all. nothing wrong with this crankshaft. And I can also feel the, ma the main bearings as well now that I'm turning it. They don't feel bad. Obviously we'll do a visual inspection once we get in there. That feels good. Not a problem. Right, so we found no problems whatsoever really, apart from a bit of water getting in and rust on the top end, the cylinder and the head and everything. Crankshaft feels just fine. So the next step is to delve into the actual crankcases. And in the manual, it tells us to remove the, the pull start mechanism. That's the, the, these little lugs here on this disc. We'll take that off and then remove this first outer cover. The generator's hidden behind there somewhere. Now, just, just to note at this point in time, we've got three input shafts for the gearbox. This one, according to the manual, is for reverse. This is for the transmission. And this is the sub-transmission. So... This will provide us, when this is moved, it will give us the, the, the really low, the super low gears. Now remember what the customer said, the bike only runs, only drives in super low. Both high and low have failed. So that could be a little clue as to what the problem is inside the gearbox. So, first job, remove that uh, steel disc and then the ring of bolts that hold this generator cover on. Here we go. See if it's a normal thread or a left hand thread, we'll soon find out, won't we? There we go. Normal thread, excellent. There we go, right. Now, I say normal thread. Ha! <laughs> that one is chewed up. Somebody stripped that and then just wound it on. So the end of the crankshaft because we could see the con rod rotating, uh, you see it's at the end of the crank, those threads on the crank are damaged. Or well, maybe they've just got bits of the nut in it. So maybe somebody's always just over tightened it, look at that. Bits of thread out of the nut stuck in the crank, but it doesn't look over healthy. We'll take a closer look a bit later on. Right, that's that bit out of the way. <laughs> what we need the nut again, will we? Okay, next job is we've got a ring of bolts to undo, which are these little 8mm uh, socket size. So I've gone and grabbed an 8mm socket. Somebody's already taken a few out. That's probably because there was an exhaust bracket here uh, and the, it would be held with the same bolts. Okay, let's crack on. I'll just stick a little bit of wood under there so you can see better what's going on. There we go. Disgusting piece of wood, isn't it? Right. Do the easy ones first. Holy moly. Jeez. There's not many threads left on that one. Either that was the wrong bolt. It looks to me like somebody's already... Oh my word, look at this. We've got a river of water running down the bench. God. Oh, we're gonna need an extension back. Jeez. Yeah, that's three. There's gotta be a lot more than that. I guess that's gonna be one as well. Let's find out. Yep, good long. Okay. And there's some more underneath, so. Let's just try and tilt it a bit further over. Hopefully it won't fall off the bench. I think. I'm just gotta change the socket. We'll get a deep. This should help us get in a bit more. Okay, so there's another one there. Any more for any more, he says. I don't know. Does it look? I'll try and bring it round a bit more. Oh yes, one hiding behind there, look. Yep, some more around the back. Oh, some more water coming out.
That's not original. <laughs> that one's too short. Yeah, I reckon somebody else has been in here at some point. So, just a quick check. I think we're good to go. Magic hammer time. Let's give it a little tap off there. Holy moly, all the water. Holy shit. Water and oil, all of our workshop. Gee, honestly. Now, you might be tempted to get a screwdriver and just lever in here. Whatever you do, don't if you're intending to put the engine back together because you're going to damage the mating surface and it's going to probably have an oil leak. So we'll try not to do that if we can help it. Now it's pulling down on the bottom. Can we get on its side? Uh, maybe. Alright, so what's going on? Well, we've got the gasket just getting caught. That's not going to stop it coming undone there. stubborn okay don't need the gasket and inside there is the generator you can see that okay that's torchy there he is look and that usually if they're bad they you'll often see it you know a burn but there was no report that it was poor charging so that generator should be good to go Ooh, a little thrust washer Came off the top shaft and there is the generator. So that washer came off there. Perfect. Now remember we're um, we're looking at evidence to find lack of lubrication as being the failure for this engine. And again, a stator is usually a really good indication if the engine's been low on oil. The stator windings, that's these windings here, are there to create an AC output for the charging system. This is a little crankshaft pickup sensor. That tells the, uh, well, it won't be an ECU, it'll tell the CDI uh, a signal as to when the crankshaft's at TDC. So it can give a spark at the right time, or do the ignition timing at the right time. Now, if the engine's got really hot and it's been low on oil, the stator often gets burnt. It doesn't get cooled well enough and it'll overheat. And looking at this, there's no sign of any kind of blackening of any of these windings. Sometimes you'll get one or two that will get really, really dark uh, because there's no cooling effect. So, that to me, on, uh, from a visual inspection, is a pass. We can also just check the bearings, make sure that they feel smooth and not rough. And they all feel pretty good. Uh, maybe that one's a bit rough. That could just be normal use. Doesn't feel too bad. Certainly serviceable, you know, it might make a bit of a noise. It's not seized up, and again, there's no bluing around the bearing as if it's got over hot. Okay, well, we can put this to one side and we can dig a bit deeper. Now, I'll just pull off some of that, uh, that loose gasket we are kicking around. Okay, so we've got this is the sub transmission, the super low input shaft here. Look, and these three gears relate to the sub transmission according to the manual. Remember, I've never taken one of these apart before, not this particular model. So it's interesting for me, as it is I'm sure for you, as to what it's all about. So we've got an idler gear, and we've got what looks to me like the drive gear and the driven gear for the sub transmission. And it tells us to remove these, but before we do, I just want to see if this gear is engaged and if we get sort of drive going through it. Well, it seems to be locked. We've got movement, but that tells me that we must be in two gears at once because we're getting mechanical lock. That can't be right. Okay, so what gears are engaged? 
I'll just take that one out of mesh. We're still locked, aren't we? Hmm. Okay. Well, this doesn't seem to be fully actuated. So let's just try and Okay, so that would take it out of gear. It's quite difficult when you haven't got the cover because everything tries to fall off all the time. Right. So that now should be disengaged. Is it all the way? It's not. Now, you see, I've never ridden this bike, so I wouldn't know what to expect it for it to do, but it does all seem to be moving quite happily, and we know that it drove in low, low. So something has moved to cause this to be in two gears. Let's just pull the sub-transmission gears off, and you can see the, you see how it's actuated. Look, this, this, will get, this fork will get pushed forward towards the camera, and it locks into these little uh, ovals here. Look, these, these, these are what we call the dogs dogs of engagement and over time there's my little screwdriver come back a little screwdriver if you're a bit rough with your machinery then this part here you see that or not starts to round and when it gets really badly rounded rather than a nice sharp 90 degree edge on it and the same on here these can jump out of gear and it's the same for any kind of gear in a motorcycle gearbox. The more rough you are, the quicker these will wear. And there are very small signs of wear just on this leading edge here, look. But again, quite serviceable at the moment. So we'll just pop those down there. And we've got thrust washers and the gear. We'll take those off. Is that gonna come off? No, it's an idler. So that's all one piece is that one. And I wonder then if it's gonna turn. It's not, so the lock had nothing to do with it being in super low. Hmm. And this this selector fork can also engage the gear behind as well, which we'll find out what that is shortly. Okay, so we could probably get rid of that one. There we go. Stick that back in there. Hey, come back. Take that one out of the way. And you can see here, look, how the selector fork works. It runs in that groove in there. As this is rotated, it moves it forwards and backwards. And it looks like it takes it from here, which would engage... That was this way around, wasn't it? So when it's in that position, it would put, bring the fork towards us and engage that outer gear, the super low. And then when it's ro rotated round and that fork runs down here, it would then engage the rear gear. Okay, well, let's see if we can get the whole thing to turn now. Oh, maybe it was just tight. Okay, so we've got, we've got movement now, look. So you can see the crankshaft's turning. We've got movement through the gearbox. If I actually do it the other way around, and I turn the crank, if I can, yeah, look. Look at that. Fantastic. But we have no drive to the final drive. You see, this one isn't turning. So the whole thing is just idling. Okay, well, let's see if we can put it back together. <laughs> this will be fun. There we go. Right, so that's that one back in. And you can see, as I turn that, Hang on, let me have some mole grips. Mole grips are great. To diagnose, you have to first understand. This is the fun bit. So we're going to st stick the mole grips on there, gingerly. In fact, we'll put them down here. There we go, and then you can see the details. As I rotate that, hang on. <laughs> there you go. Can you see that? I think you can see that. You can just see the little, the little wheel. Let's go up in the world, hang on. There you go. Right. Oh, mate, it's going mad. Someone must be here. So you can see the little wheel. 
just up there, look. And as we rotate this, it drops into each of those little grooves. So basically, it won't go all the way because the nor grips are hitting. There you go, hitting the shaft. I just take that off. So there's quite a few positions on that one lever, look. One, two, three. Three, I think there is. Right, one, two, three. That makes sense because we had the three positions in here. We had the when the fork's all the way back here, all the way forward here, and then again all the way back. Like I say, I don't know what the lever movement is on the vehicle. Okay, now this one, this fork went back in there, so we'll have to engage the fork first and then put the put the pin through. There we go. Get rid of the air. So now, when I rotate that, you will see it's now going to move this down and engage that back gear. Now you've got to remember that with a gearbox everything usually is turning a little bit. So let's see if we can turn it for you. Not quite gone all the way in. So maybe that's not quite on the right one. Hang on. I'll just pull that off again. You'll see here again some more dogs and that. That will engage when it slides because one of those should be free. That shouldn't be free, key to the shaft, surely. Otherwise, why would you bother engaging it? Hmm, interesting. Okay, so that should slide down there. And engage. That gear looks to me like it's seized on the shaft. That gear here should be spinning on this shaft because otherwise, you know, it's permanently driven to the shaft. I don't think that's the case. It shouldn't be like that. Huh. We might have found a problem. Okay. Well, let's get some circlip pliers and just pull that little circlip off and remove that gear and we'll see if it's seized on the shaft. Interesting. Okay, we can take the idler out of the way. Don't need that for now. That can go back on quite easily. Yeah, that, that should spin freely. This one does. You can see there, look. Can you see the shaft? Hang on, let's just go down a little bit. So you see here, this gear, this one, can rotate independently to the shaft. Whereas this one here seems to be stuck to the shaft. And that could be a sign of poor lubrication. Remember, it's quite high up in the gearbox as well. So it's going to get less lubrication than these. Hmm. And there is some, some significant wear on the dogs on this particular gear as well. So, circlip pliers required. Right, I'm just going to move you guys over to one side a little bit. Bring all these bits together. There we go. Let's see if I can get in and move this to get this circlip removed. Now these might be a little bit big. Now it's always good to have your little flat screwdriver with you. Oh man that couldn't have gone any better could it? Right pliers. Okay, so we're just going to ease that down the shaft now. There we go. Right, now this gear. What the hell's going on with it? Well, there's a washer in there. Now the washer's key to the shaft. Let's see if we can get that out. Let's see if we can get it out with a pig. Okay. 
do it. There we are. Okay, washer is off. Okay, so if we look in there, it doesn't look like the gear is key to the shaft. Could be wrong. Where's my pick? Just doesn't make any sense why it would have dogs and be key to the shaft, but I stand corrected. I think it is. For some strange reason, Suzuki have decided to put dogs on the gear when it's already key to the shaft. It should really come off there then. Hmm. That was an Ivan, hmm. Was it Ivan? There we go, look, she's moving. And you can see that that one, like we said before, is keyed to the shaft. So why on earth it has the selector to key into it? I have no idea. And there is some damage on it as well. Where it's been rammed in. Very strange. Don't quite understand that. I'll have to look into that a bit more. Okay, another circlip. You can do it. Always have a little screwdriver. Always have a little screwdriver to hand. Makes it a lot easier. Ooh, nearly. We're halfway off. Now this one should now come off, there we go, and again another little thrust washer on the front of there, and one on the back, there look you see, one on the front, one on the back, let's not lose those. Okay I've taken a quick look at the service manual and we've taken off everything except for the little detent uh, here look, the little springy thing with the roller that locks that um, select a drum in place uh, between each gear position. We don't need to remove the flywheel yet, the manual says leave that on for now. Uh, so we're going to head round and pull the clutch cover off, which is the other outer cover on the, uh, on the engine basically, on the crankcase. So we'll spin it around and we'll start work on that one. Now remember, we've not found any problems yet. We really haven't. Everything seems to be working as it should do. The guy said it only drove in super low, not high and not low, and potentially there was a, a lubrication problem. This vehicle, this engine, will probably have a centrifugal type clutch, and that clutch will be oil immersed most likely, and therefore it relies on lubrication. If the lubrication was down, then the clutch might have burnt out, and if it was struggling to uh, transmit drive, you know, from the crankshaft through into the gearbox, then when it's in super low, there might be just enough grip on the clutch to move the vehicle. In high and especially in, well, sorry, especially in high and in low, it may be too high a ratio, too much torque for it to actually move the vehicle forwards. So it could be a clutch issue. Maybe the guys just burnt the clutch out. So we'll find out. All sorts of problems, couldn't they, that can cause this. Right, let's dig a bit deeper. Here we go. It's getting lighter by the minute, which is good. All right, we'll spin that around. I'm constantly mopping up the water, a little bit of oil that's coming out of it. I'm just trying to keep the bench reasonably, reasonably workable. Okay, let's get rid of the bit of wood for now. I should be all right with that. Now we've got a load more uh, eight millimeter bolts. So let's whiz those out if we can. Torch, you sit over there. You sit over there a bit. You can light that part up. Okay. Now behind here is the oil filter. And they're all tense. We can't do that. I'm not sure if we need to do or not, to be honest.
Now that one's going to have to come out because that's a shared bolt that keeps his cover on and it runs all the way through. Pretty sure that's a cover. Yeah, it is. Okay, what else have we got? Some of the one there, look. Oh yeah, clutchy. Another one right there. Look at that, three and a half litres of oil goes in this little 280cc engine. That's fantastic. So you can do a good, nice gap between your oil changes. Okay, following it round. They're all done. That's done. Dun, 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 dun. Right, there's some tens to do next. Where's my 10 mil socket gone? There it is. Right. Let's see what's behind here. Ooh, that looks dodgy. Somebody replace it with a nylon. Oh yeah, there we go, look. It's not an oil filter, it's a water filter, look. Good job. Oh, nice. You see all that, look? Got to, where's, my, where's the torch? We've got emulsified oil in the filter. All grey and gloopy. Hmm. I think there's more to it than this, uh, than what this customer's been saying. Now, magic hammer again. Let's see if we can crack this cover off. Jeez, it's really, really tight. some movement. Bingo! Okay, let's just... Well, we'll take it off very gingerly. How's that? Here we go. Oh yeah. Well, it's pretty clean inside. And, and again, we've saved the gasket. Fantastic. Now, upon closer inspection, it looks like the reason why it was so hard to get off was that dowel there is quite rusty. Nothing to do, I don't think, with the water ingress. This is just old age and just damp getting in around the, through the gasket. Okay, so what have we got? Well, we've got a centrifugal clutch just here. And that's got the three shoes, the very heavily weighted shoes, and they get thrown out against these springs. Uh, against the spring force and they made contact with the drum so it looks like the shoes are driven directly yes directly off the crank so if I turn the, hold the drum and turn the shoes you'll see the conrod popping in and out just down there look so the shoes are directly driven by the crankshaft and then the drum has a sleeve ah! We'll come back to that. Has a sleeve which then has a gear down here which then drives your clutch pack. And we'll get to that a bit further down the line. But essentially, when the engine's just idling, there should be no drive into the gearbox. It's only when you give it a bit of a rev that these shoes get thrown out and then the drive is transmitted through the clutch pack into the gearbox through all the various multitude of gears in there and finally out through the final drive to the rear wheels and the front wheels. This is the rear, rear end of the vehicle of the quad and then you've got another output for the front wheels because it's a four wheel drive quad don't forget. Okay well first job is to inspect the centrifugal clutch and there's already a telltale sign that might be a problem. Here we go. Right, just to get rid of it, this is the inside of the clutch cover casing, I suppose you can call that. It's got the little sight glass down there for the oil, and it's got this bit here, which is to do with the automatic clutch adjustment for this clutch pack. Because there's no clutch lever on this bike, basically when you start to move the gear lever to change from say first to second, or second to third, the initial movement 
moves this arm and disengages this clutch pack. It's pretty clever stuff, but we'll cover that in more detail a bit later. I'm more interested in this puppy. This is the centrifugal clutch. And there is actually a one-way bearing in there as well, which will then give you a bit of uh, engine braking when you're going down a hill. So if you've lost engine braking, it'll be the one-way clutch just behind here. And we'll dig it out shortly. Right, I'm going to get rid of this for now. So, centrifugal clutch, and a bit more close-up detail. So what's really going on? Well, as the crankshaft's spinning around, and I'll see if I can replicate that with the... If I can hold on this still. There you are, look. It's going to work. So I'm holding the transmission stationary, trying to hang on, let's wedge a little rag. I was always taught a little trick, just to wedge your rag in the gears, and that way you're not going to harm them, but it holds them still. Okay, so I'll turn the, there we are, I'm going to turn the flywheel, there you go. So as I turn the crankshaft, this is the engine running really on a really slow motion camera, Okay, it's just idling. You can see that the these uh, shoes are inbound. They're held in place very tightly, pulled in by these heavy springs here, look, one per shoe. So as the engine spins faster and faster, the weight, the mass of these thick steel plates that make up the, the, the backing of the shoe with the friction material, those obviously get thrown outwards due to, well, centrifugal or centripetal force, depending on who you are. And then more and more force goes between the friction lining and the drum. So more drive is transmitted to the drum. Now, of course, the only problem with this is if you get a rider that basically is on and off the throttle all the time, and, and you know that sort of sweet spot of engine RPM where this clutch is constantly slipping, it's going to create a hell of a lot of heat. Now, if I just turn the engine around slowly, you will see now what caught my eye. If you look down the side of this drum, you see it's all black. Now that wouldn't be black when it was new. That's being caused by massive amounts of heat. So the rider has been slipping the clutch or the clutch has been slippy for some reason, whether he's put the wrong oil in it, or friction reducing additives in his oils to try and save some petrol, I don't know. But basically this drum has been getting red hot. You can see how it's browned off as the, the metal. And it shouldn't be like that. So the first job is we're going to pull this off and we'll take a little look at the condition of the linings, the actual friction material on these shoes and we'll see how badly worn it is, if it's burnt, if it's cracked, all that kind of stuff. It's a good telltale sign that there could be slippage in this. And if this is really bad and it can't transfer much drive, then the bike may well need to be in super low to actually get anywhere. Uh, otherwise this clutch will continue to slip, just like a, a worn out clutch on a car. Okay, so we're going to need to undo this big nut here, which looks like maybe a 27, so we'll get the big windy gun out. The impact wrench and we'll blast that off we'll get this taken off and we'll take a look right said Fred now that rag that I wedge between the two primary drive gears drive and the driven on the clutch we should be able to hold it in place hopefully he says maybe oh no don't tell me the battery's flat it is god damn torchy What's yours like? Perfect. Fully charged. Right, we'll do a swap. Okay, let's give that a go. So I reckon this is a left-hand thread. Not entirely sure. Yeah. Pretty sure it is. They do strange stuff. Is right, full of uh, thread lock as well. <clears throat> okay, so maybe there's a washer in there. Yep, aluminium washer by the looks of it. Cool. Now that should come off there now, and it should be inside. Let's get rid of the shoes for a second. Look here now. That's driven. 
Oh, there he is. Okay. So that gear there, if you can see that, is is connected directly to the drum itself. So when the drum is gripped by these shoes, drive is transferred from the crankshaft into the uh, the primary drive drive gear <laughs> onto the primary drive driven gear, which is this one here, the large one, which then feeds the drive into the clutch pack uh, via the basket, and then it goes through the input shaft into the gearbox. And remember we said there was a one-way clutch. That is, let me get it out. That is there, look. You see? Little sprag clutch. So if your bike's freewheeling down a hill, this has got little flats on it and needs to be replaced. And you should replace all three components. You should replace the sprag clutch, which is this bit. You should replace the inner, which is on my finger there, look, in the middle. And you should replace the drum. The whole thing is really one component. But this seems to be working just fine and it didn't look too bad. Can't really see any flats. But we'll take a closer look, maybe later on in the video. We'll see. Get back in there. God, honestly, it came out fine. Went back in fine last time. But it can be a bit of a pain to get in. We'll work it out later on. Oh, bug in me now. Oh, so close. There we are. Right, it's in. Okay, what I'm interested in are these. So let's do a close up. Okay, so what are we looking for? Well, First of all, are they worn out? Well, we've got these grooves here that are still evident. So that's an indication that they haven't worn too much. It's obviously worn a bit, hasn't it? Because it's old. And they're a little bit black, which means that they have got a little bit hot, but they're not... Okay, it's starting to break up a little bit. There's a few little chunks missing out of there. Big chunk missing out of there. But, you know, they're not... Where's that rag? They're not absolutely horrific. I have seen a lot worse. One of the problems is if, if people top their engine oil up and use car engine oil. Now car engine oil often has friction reducers in it and things like this that rely on friction to work can really get affected by that. And unfortunately you can't, once it's in the material you can't get it out again. It's like a brake shoe. You act as a brake shoe. You know, just like your brakes on your mountain bike. If you get, if you're cleaning your bike with CRC or WD-40 and you get some on the brake disc and it gets into the brake shoes, the guy at the bike shop is going to tell you you need some new brake shoes. This one actually is, it is starting to break up. So there are signs that it's got a bit hot. It's, oh, it's sintered look as well. There's bits of metal in there. But yeah, it's quite rough. There's, there's bits missing. That, you know, which is an indication it has been cooked. Let's take a look at the drum. Jeez, Torchy, not do that. Okay, let's turn it over there. Because what we're looking for is a reason why this machine might not, you know, it hasn't got the drive. Because the engine was still running, don't forget. It just would only drive in super low. So there's a friction problem. There's a drive, something's wrong with a drive train. And you can see there, look, you can see the, the blackening of that drum. That's been red hot at some point, which will have changed. Well, actually, what really happens when metal gets so hot, and I, I don't know the, the terminology for it. I'm sure AVE will be able to tell you all that. But when, when uh, metal gets really, really hot and it's immersed in oil, the oil actually gets into the metal, and it can, uh, it can change the friction coefficient of how well these brake shoes, the lining on these shoes, can actually grip this drum. Now one thing I have just noticed, i get my little stick again, this surface here should normally be completely flat, and when I ran my thumb across it I could feel, yes, I can feel ridges. Now obviously it's only going to wear where the shoe makes contact, and these shoes have got grooves, so we're not going to get any wear where these little black lines are, but it's an, indi it's an indication of how much the drum has worn, which is quite substantial. It's not often you see it as bad as that. Not on the machines that I look after, anyway. So it's a little bit ribbed as well. So it's got hot. The shoes are starting to break up. The signs of massive overheating. This, again, is an issue. Okay, well, 
that'll do for now on that one. That goes in there like that. We'll stick that to one side and let's take a little look at that clutch pack because you know it could be the clutch pack that's also slipping. Maybe maybe that's got burnt out as well, which is unlikely but possible. Now we've got two inputs left. Maybe we've already taken away the low, which was down here, the super low. Um, we've got the transmission input, so that's going to be you know first to fifth gear. And then we've got the other one here, which is, they call it in the manual, uh, shaft one, which is basically for reverse. We're not too worried about reverse at the moment. We're more worried about going forwards. So this shaft runs through the casing, and I'm going to put the mole grips on it now so we can see what it does at the other end. Easy. Okay, so we've got Mr. Mole Grips on the shaft. The shaft comes through here. It does a number of jobs. First job is it moves this arm. This is the first thing to move, and it can move either way. And if I get those other bits, now these sit on there like that. Now it's a pretty loose fit, and there's these three ball bearings. Now it's a little bit hard to sort of comprehend, but if I go and get the casing that goes over the end, then you'll get a better idea what's going on. So, Inside that casing, we've got three grooves on this plate here. So if I stick that on there like that, and then pretend to be the arm, and rotate this, what's happening, if I try and get the, get the angle just right for you, can you see that the distance from the casing and that plate increases as it turns? Because what's happening is those ball bearings are riding up these ramps here. You look nice and close. You've got these three different ramps. So I just do the ball bearings on their own. They sit in there. And as they rotate, they ride up the ramp. So you say, well, Andy, what's the point in that? You know, it looks great, but, you know, it's not really... It's not really... Uh, how's that going to affect the engine? And what's it going to do? Well, there you go. Look. So again, just rides up. Let's try and get it around one more. There we go. So you can see it one, one last time, it rides up, look, when that lever turns. And it does it in either direction, it makes no difference at all. So there, yeah. see it riding up as it rotates. Okay, so we now know how that bit works. And that's caused by this arm being moved when the, the rider wants to change gear. Oh, the old grips have come off, hang on. <laughs> hang on a second, just bear with me. Know what's going on there? Right, they're not tangnail grips, unfortunately. Okay, so as that arm moves now, we know that this rotates. So as it rotates, it pushes against the casing. Now, of course, the casing isn't going to move, so this component has to move inwards. And when it moves inwards, it re it um, releases the clutch, and that allows the clutch to slip. And when it's slipping or disengaged. The bike, you know, this lever moves further by the rider and it, cha it changes gear inside the gearbox and then it releases, then the clutch re-engages again. Pretty simple. And the first time I came across this was when I was about 13 years old on a Honda C50 uh, moped. Had a very, very similar setup. And the adjustment to get this bit just right, working just right, because don't forget, these, these plates will wear over time, is you can remove... That little cover there, look on the outside, a bit like a tappet uh, cover. Remove that, and you can get access to this adjuster. And you can easily adjust it. Very, very good. Very cool, and a super reliable system. Okay. So, when that's pushed on there, it releases the pressure on this pressure plate, and then the clutch can slip. I wonder if we can maybe replicate that. We could give it a go. Okay, so as the rider you know, moves the gear lever, which is going to cause this, to, this little lever here to move, that's going to cause that mechanism we looked at with the three ball bearings to apply a force onto the end of this rod here, look. And this rod is sat, sits in a bearing, because all this is spinning around. This will be stationary, and of course the clutch is whizzing around really fast, probably in that direction actually, whizzing around as the engine's running. 
and we want to change gear so we've got to disconnect drive momentarily so by pushing really hard on here it pushes the pressure plate that sits right at the back of this clutch pack it pushes it away from the camera, it pushes it away like that which creates a small amount of gap between each of these plates upon top let's do you an overview just before we start pulling things apart so we're going to go up in the world a little bit, where's the knob? Oh, yeah. so we're going to go up there like that and then we're going to hang on, where's the notch? where's the notch? come back almost did it there you go okay how's that all right so we'll come back a little bit so you got that that push rod in in shot as well brilliant what a professional okay so as a force is applied inwards away from the camera on that push rod that force is transferred all the way through it compresses the four clutch springs a little bit more and the pressure plate at the back, the rear pressure plate moves towards this large gear just here, look. So it was, moves away from the camera and that creates a gap, a small air gap between each of these friction and steel plates. And that allows the clutch, you know, to disengage. So the drive coming from the, um, from the centrifugal clutch, from the crankshaft, uh, no longer is transmitted into the gearbox. And that then will allow a, a nice smooth gear change to occur. Once the gear, gear's gone into, into mesh, then of course the rider takes his foot away from the gear lever and this, this, uh, this rod here, this lever, returns to its normal position. And of course then there's no more force applied to this push rod and the clutch pack is fully engaged. Now, the force applied to these plates is completely dependent on how strong those springs are. So, if we find that we've got damage and significant wear and overheating to these plates, these friction plates, then it may well be that these springs have lost their tension. But we'll take a look. Let's see how badly damaged these plates are first. Right, first job will be to remove this arm off the end of this, uh, this gear shaft here, look. Take the old bolt out. There we go. Look. Cool. That's that done. Now it may be that we can. I mean, with four springs in there, I just cannot get enough force to, you know, mimic what's happening to the end here. But if we strip it down and maybe just put, I don't know, a couple of springs in there, maybe I can do it with my thumb. Now, when you're undoing these, you've got to be very careful. When you're doing them up, you'll be super careful, and you'll see why in a minute. You should really undo them just a bit at a time so you don't put any pressure on the little tiny turrets that uh, come off that rear pressure plate because they're very, these things are really easily broken. And you know, you're not talking a few, a few dollars, it's quite expensive. Right, that's one. And again, these bolts, would, I would say, would normally go in with thread lock. Because, you, again, you can't tighten up too much, so... But you don't want them flying out, do you? Definitely not. Could cause a bit of a problem. So maybe as we pull it apart, you'll get an idea of how this actually works. So... That is just the mounting plate, you know, for the push rod. And when that's pushed this way it actually compresses those springs, it can slide inside that shaft there, look it's hollow, so it can slide in and out and when it's pushed by that mechanism, as that lever here rotates it pushes in and it basically pushes down on the clutch springs, it compresses them further now this plate is threaded into these little turrets, those four bolts and as you can see, that is not connected to this outer plate, this, the, the outer pressure plate here, look. It's separate and it sits right at the back of these clutch plates. So when the springs are in place and, you, and the clutch is engaged, the springs are pulling this towards the camera really, really hard. And that's squashing all the plates together. When we push this plate 
that way it pushes that mechanism back and now with it back if I get a screwdriver you may be able to see I can separate the crates quite freely oh another overhead shot coming up okay so with that being pulled in by the springs the plates are all tight there's no air gaps between the plates it's quite hard to if I hold it at the top and pull it you know I just put a little bit of pressure on the screwdriver there's no movement the plates have been squashed together if I then push that back all the way which is basically what this component's doing then now you'll see that there's lots and lots of space they're actually quite loose are these plates and what you can do is if I hold the basket I should be able to turn that round there you go look so now you can see that there is no drive there's a bit of drag sure but there's no drive going through that clutch pack anymore if I pull that up or put the springs back on let's do that if I put a couple of springs in there I'll just put two in not four that's going to really upset somebody me doing that okay careful right okay so now those clutch packs uh, clutch plates are all very very hard so you can see they're like it's really tough to try and move them apart and that's more flex on the plates shouldn't do this really because it'll damage them but uh, they've been very heavily clamped just by those two springs. Now, I don't think I've got enough oomph to be able to squash those two springs down. Probably not. Nah, no chance. Okay. But you can see, as soon as I release those, uh, the tension on those two springs, the clutch plates will be allowed to separate. Okay enough. Let's get it pulled apart and take a look at the condition of those friction plates and what kind of problems we can get. There we go. Right, we're going to need to undo that big nut in the middle and there'll be somewhere to be bent over with a metal tab. Probably, maybe, usually is. Huh. Can't see it on this one. Right, said Fred. Now, hopefully, this will be a normal thread on here. There we go. Fortunately, not over tight. But usually, that metal plate behind it is bent over the nut to stop it coming undone. Like a little locking tab. Way. And that's actually it's concave. Strange, almost like a spring nut. Hmm. Okay, we'll put that in the parts tray. Now we can take the whole thing off, hopefully. That's the plan. There we go. Right. Back down to the bench and we'll strip it down. Okay, working around a camera and two tripods and a torch. Okay. So we've got here, this is the outer pressure plate. And the reason why I say it's called the outer pressure plate is because that surface there is what the, is applying the other half of the pressure. It's sort of squeezing the plates together. You know, this is the fixed end, don't forget. And the other end, which is connected to this, this is the one that moves forwards and backwards depending on uh, whether the clutch is to be um, you know, actuated. Uh, sorry, engaged or disengaged. Engaged plates squashed together, disengaged plates allowed to slip between themselves. So these are the plates. This is what we're interested in. And what we're looking for is where and them being burnt. Well there's some discoloration, which is looks more like rusting to be fair. There's quite a bit on that one. Now, 
I'll be doing a video in more depth on checking uh, clutch pack plates, both the friction plates and the steel plates. But just on this video, just a quick initial inspection, and it doesn't look like they're too bad. I mean, if these have been slipping a lot, we would see a lot of bluing on the steel plates. We would see cracks within the uh, friction material, maybe even bits of friction material missing. Uh, the plates can also buckle, because at the moment they're nice and flat, that's how they're supposed to be. But again, with heat, they can get bent. So you can check them on an on a engineer's flat plate or a, paint, or a big thick piece of glass with feeler gauges or a torch as well. You can check the, that they're nice and flat just in a number of different ways. And all of them seem just fine. I can't really see a problem with that. Not, you know, okay, it's worn, but they're not, they're not going to completely lose drive. Hmm. Okay. Now, just so you can get a better idea how this thing works, this is the rear pressure plate, and this is the one that can, that basically, when the springs, uh, the clutch is engaged and the springs are applying the, the pressure, their force, this is pulled upwards in the basket. Yeah. Okay, upwards towards the camera. Obviously in the vehicle, it's pulled this way, you know? I'm, I'm massively exaggerating how far it's moved, but you get the idea. So to engage, this would come this way, and to disengage, it will be pushed back, and that would allow clearance between the drive plates. So engaged, it comes this way, and this, it's, only, it's only the spring force that's clamping those plates together. And when you want to disengage, then the push rod will push this back and compress the springs further. Wow. Okay, now, another problem with the basket, if you look down here, you'll see little indents. So, as, as the bike weighs in, as it's used more and more, those plates will start to dig in into the aluminium and cause ridges. And that can cause the clutch to be difficult to disengage. It can cause clutch drag and that kind of stuff as well. Yes, there's some minor ridges. Yes, it's not as good as a new one, but no, that wouldn't cause the problem of loss of drive. Okay, that goes back in there again. Ooh, one last thing I forgot to mention. On the back of the clutch pack, you'll find these springs, these big springs. These are damper springs to take out some of the pulsations from the crankshaft. Um, because it's a four-stroke engine, it only gets power on one of four strokes. So it's a bit of a thump, 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 you know? So these help to take out some of the, some of that um, jarring, I suppose you could call it. Excessive sort of sudden pulses. Take it out before the drive enters into the gearbox. And that way, hopefully, your gears last a bit longer. Now, we need to get that uh, this sort of bush taken out now. You can do it. There we go. We have movement. Bigger screwdriver required. Screwdrivers are fantastic tools. There we go. Now, is that a thrust washer as well? Yes. There we go. Look. So we'll have that out of there as well. And we'll put that with the clutch pack. Because this is probably going to go back together at some point. Just for shits and giggles. Okay. Okay, what else is left? Well, down here we've got a crankshaft gear on there which is driving the oil pump. Now that gear will probably just slide off there. There we go, look, because there's a keyway. So we can get rid of that. And then there's the oil pump just spinning away quite happily. So we'll take the oil pump out at some point. If we need to do it, we might not need to take that out actually. But we'll get that, that uh, nut off, that left hand thread nut, and that drive for the oil pump. Coolio, and what's next? Well, looking at this, we've still got the gear selection mechanism. Um, so this selector rod here will actually draw out this way, but I think we're going to need to undo that nut, that bolt first, for that to happen. Okay, and we might need to undo that one as well. Possibly. As you can see, as you're changing gear, 
it's going to rotate the uh, the drum, the selector drum, just here, look. And again, we've got a similar little ball, a little wheel on a spring, which is that one there that's giving us a detent. And that's going to lock it in each, in each position. So, let's see if I can change gear for you. The guy didn't say he had no gears. Oh, need more grip. He said it would only drive in low. Sorry, super low. However, doesn't seem to be a lot going on there. And we did seem to notice that we were stuck in two gears earlier on. I just took out. It doesn't want to rotate at all. And it's already on the end of that drum. Hmm. Okay, well, we'll pull these bits off and then we should be ready for splitting the casing, hopefully. Right, said Fred, let's get this one out first. There you go, look, shouldn't be too hard. Shouldn't be too hard. <laughs> He says. There we go. And that just basically hooks at either end onto some little lugs that behind this disc. You'll see those a bit later on. Ah, washer. God damn. Okay, we can get this one out now. Goodbye, Mulgrips. You've done a good job, sort of. There we go. Now we should be able to take all that off in one go, actually. There we go. Right, let's get that out. And that's uh, a little spring on the back, which sits... It's under tension when it's fitted. It sits either side of that plate. something drop there he is mr. washer okay let's get that off there there we go that's that little roller I was talking about there look and that roller runs as a detent see now it can just flop around as before when this was in place it would sort of flip to one position or the other it wouldn't be infinite like it is now okay what's next well we can take the end off that And then you can see the little pegs that sit behind it. There you go, look. So, if I just get Mr. Claw, you'll see now how that works. That sits in there like that. And when, you change, when the shaft rotates, it pulls that round one, or it pushes it the other way. Clever stuff, isn't it? Okay, so we now have two uh, machine screws to remove and we can actually take the uh, the, uh, the drive off for the oil pump as well it's just a little circlip so Mr. Circlip might come off with a flat screwdriver let's have a go there you go right He's going to come off. It feels pretty good. It's going to fly across the workshop. No, saved it. Good job. Right, that should come off there now. There we go. And there's a little pin look that locates it. I'm going to lose that. See in there, there's a little tiny sort of two cutouts that that pin would sit in. And that pin sits. I just turn him a little bit, it just sits in there. Like that. So when you put this gear back on again, you've got to line that up. Which is like that. And then the circuit goes on. Pretty cool. But that will get lost. So we'll put it somewhere safe. 
Okay, and that's the oil pump, and you can see it's even got an arrow to show you which way around it should go. And it's made by Mikuni. They make carb writers as well, Mikuni carbs. Very good. Right, so we've got these two machine screws to get out. That's going to be immense amounts of fun. I'll get my screwdriver. Right, I'm going to stand at the back and pull towards myself, I think, would be the easiest way of doing this. Okay. Jeez! Hang on, we're going to change our tact. Pretty sure that's too big. Well, I don't know. It looks too big, but it might work. Oh, yeah. Done. Right, get those little tabs out. Come back. All is forgiven. That's one. There's a lot more to do on a motorcycle engine, isn't there? Because it's a gearbox and an engine together. This video is going to be a lot longer than that. Uh, engine autopsy one isn't it okay last but not least they want us to take the oil pump out so let's pull you back a little bit uh, not sure these look the same bolt yeah they are okay maybe an extension bar a bit more control hey, let's give it another go let's try that one the trick with this is you've got to push hard to keep it in the in the head of the bolt Nope. Yes. Ho, ho. Ho, 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 ho. Okay. Yes. This one I think is a bit chewed up. Yeah, it is. <sighs> okay. So uh, two out of three ain't bad. That's a meatloaf song, isn't it? I like meatloaf, he's a good guy. Right. Okay, we'll get rid of those two. And then, oh, what should we use? Should we try some mole grips first? If that doesn't work, we'll have to use a punch and a hammer. And that's going to cause earthquakes. Bugger. Okay. Right, decent mole grips. Let's try these. Now, if you do chew up a bolt like this, because we're inevitably going to chew it up, then you should replace it. Don't put it back in chewed up. And if you try and turn it with the screwdriver at the same time, that actually helps. Well, yeah, that one is a tight one. Let's just try that on the end that way. I'm to get a bit more movement. Yeah, and how tight it is. These are pretty cool mole grips, these, because they sort of self... self-tighten, but they can also be a bit of a pain sometimes as well. Yeah. Okay, I'll get a punch. Right, prepare for earthquakes. Now, when you're doing one of these, it's important you, first of all, Put a little niche, a little mark on it, so you've got something to punch from, or against, should I say. So we're not trying to rotate at the moment. We're just making a notch in it. Now we're going to try and rotate it. A bit more movement, a bit more of an angle. Wow, start around this side, have another go. Sorry camera.
Jeez, angles are all over the place. Sorry, camera, you're going to have to move out of the way a bit. There you go. Alright, it's having a big go. Holy crap, it's like butter. What were you thinking, Suzuki? There we go, we got it. We got movement. So, like I was saying, if you're going to mutilate a bolt like this, there is no way you'd be putting that back in again. I'm sure I've got a spare one somewhere. Okay, Mr. Oil Pump should be able to come out of there now. And of course, you will be able to strip that and check it. The little screw there to take out. Better separate the two halves, take a look. If you've had metal through your engine, you have to replace this. Never ever leave the old oil pump in because you can guarantee it'll have been badly affected by all the shrapnel. Right, I've just checked. The next job is to remove the speedo drive, which is bolted to here on the casing. As you can see, it's already gone. So we don't have to remove it. But yours won't be, so you'll need to remove that next. Right, next job is to get that flywheel off. I'm not looking forward to that. I'm not sure I've got the right puller. Here we go. Right, Mr. Flywheel. So, is that... That is a normal thread. Oh, is that going to fit? It's not, is it? We need a deep socket. God damn. Right, it says a 29mm offset ring spanner should fit onto those flats there, look, as part of the flywheel. I don't have a 29. I've got a 28. I've got a 30. I haven't got a 29. You're going to kill me. But I do have a monkey wrench. Now, it might hold it, it might not. If it doesn't, we'll come up with a new plan. Right, you better step back a bit. Here we go. Jeez, wrong socket. What the hell? 22 deep. Let's move Mr. Torchy as well. Golly, it could all go tragically wrong. I am just going to hold it. Oh yeah, bloody professional, vice-like grip, you see. Okay, well that had thread lock on it, lots of thread lock. So the next job is we need a puller, and the puller will screw into these three holes here, be a flat plate with a big bolt in the middle, crank up the bolt, and boom, off it comes. There's also, by the looks of it, threads in here for an alternative type puller, probably a Suzuki special part, I'll say special tool, which will have an, uh, a female internal thread and it'll wind onto there and again, big bolt. It's actually better to have the Suzuki one, I would say, because you're pulling right on where the force is. Whereas right back here, you can actually distort the flywheel. Not a good idea. What you don't want to do is hit that with a hammer and try and shock it off. Now, even if you don't damage the, fly, uh, damage the crankshaft, the sheer shock will harm the magnets in this flywheel and it'll render it junk. So whatever you do, don't use a hammer. Not even with a block of wood. Don't use it. It's, it's a bad thing and even though you won't see the damage you've done, this you may have problems with a charging system later on and that kind of stuff. My problem is I've got to try and find a puller that's going to fit. Damn. Okay, well we've got to a point where I need to make a flywheel puller. So it's getting a bit late in the day, I'm going to call it quits. This is now going to be a two-part series. But what we've done so far, quick recap, we started off at this, the engine end of this assembly. We took you know, the, uh, the camshaft out, took the cylinder head off, took the cylinder off, inspected all those components, inspected the, the piston, uh, for any signs of poor lubrication, you know, the customer said it just stopped. Now, unfortunately, customers are not particularly descriptive on what it what he meant by it just stopped. Did the engine stop? Did the bike just stop? Did it lose drive? Who knows, to be honest. But 
So far, we've not found any issues with lack of lubrication. The crankshaft's good, the big end's good, the little end's good, the skirts on the piston, no scoring. The cylinder, sure, a bit of rusting, but not really any scoring. There's nothing to indicate that the piston has seized in the bore. Yeah, anyway, so we've pulled the clutch packs off with the centrifugal clutch and the clutch pack itself. And again, there's nothing really untoward that we've found in either of those two items. So, I have a hunch. I think the problem is right in the middle of the gearbox. That's going to be tomorrow's job. Right then, crew, a bit of bonus footage for you. I could not sleep last night. I really couldn't. I kept waking up thinking, what's really going on with this transmission? The customer complaint was it only drove in, in super low, not high and not low. That has to be a clue. Because even if there was some drive through the clutch packs, and they, we've inspected them now and they seem fine, certainly serviceable, you know, there, there would have been some drive. It wouldn't have been zero drive. And don't forget, there's going to be some ratio overlap as well. When you're in super low fifth, for example, that's going to be a much higher ratio speed um, than, let's say, first gear low or first gear high. So I don't think it's a clutch pack issue. We can ignore all of that. The customer didn't mention any problems with using first to fifth gear, so I think we can ignore the main normal gearbox. I think we need to take another look at that transfer box. So I got up really early this morning, came outside, and uh, the reason why I did that really early is I've got lots of other jobs to do today, but this has been bugging me. So I came outside, and I just had a little play around with the gears, and I took a look at the service manual, and this is what I found. Okay, so this is, if I just zoom back out again, this is the section of the service manual that covers uh, the strip down and the inspection, well the inspection actually of all the various components and I found this diagram now if we just zoom up we can see here we've got the idler gear we've also got the, the next shaft along and there's your selector fork that's the left hand selector fork as we were looking on it uh, on the input shaft uh, from the five-speed gearbox. The shaft is along here and this selector fork basically moves this collar with the dogs either that way to engage gear number 10 or to, you know, over to the right towards the camera um, to engage gear number 14 depending on what gear you're in. And I really wanted to know what gears were responsible for what. So I have, I've spent some time and I've labelled things up but what's what struck me was yesterday we had an issue where we found that this gear here was permanently keyed to the shaft. Um, if you see this one here, this one it slides, spins on the shaft freely, as does that one. There's a little bush in there, as does that one. And this one, I thought, I need to have a little look at the diagram on that. And it's got an insert. Now the insert has the, uh, the female splines, the, the outside splines to go onto the shaft. But the gear itself should be uh, smooth. It's a, basically, there'd be a bush in there and it says to oil it, which indicates that these two components should spin independently of each other. They should move independently. And if I remember rightly, yesterday, that gear seemed to be very difficult to engage and I questioned the fact that it was permanently keyed to the, to the splines. And then, when we were going through the gears, we got mechanical lock. So it made me think last night of a problem that we had in England on one of Ben's quad bikes. So, we'll head over to the gearbox and I want to inspect that gear further. Transfer box. Inspect that gear further and then maybe put the whole thing back together and work out what gear does what. Okay, here we go. Right, this is the gear in question. Now, uh, I've already been labelling up bits and pieces on these things so we're just going to remove the circlip and that little collar there look where's my rag now you remember yesterday it was really hard to engage this gear 
And if we look, and it was actually quite tight on the shaft as well, sliding it on. In fact, I can show you that. There we go, look, one gearbox. And when we slided it, oh, slided it, when we slid it on, it just seemed to be quite tight, you know, you're especially down that back end. I can't, oh, I can just pull it off now. It was, we had to use a screwdriver yesterday to get it off there. So, closer inspection. There we go. According to the diagram, this should be in two pieces. This collar here should be, should be able to turn independently of the gear and we should be able to push it out. Now, if we look really closely on there, now I don't know how well it's going to come out of the camera, but there's some there's some darkening of the metal here, look. It's all quite, I won't say it burns, but it's definitely overheated. It's got, I mean, I was thinking maybe it was a, you know, a, a, a manufacturing finish, but it's not. Now there's also, if you can just see in there, look, there's a little tiny drilling to allow oil to enter whilst it's in use, and that's going to help to lubricate that bush. Now it only has... It only has one. Now the question is, ah, <laughs> okay, I've just spotted something. I'll show you. Can you see on the shaft, we've got an oil supply. There's another drilling just there, look. And it's only on one of those splines. So, if somebody assembled this gearbox and didn't line up, where is it? That oh, was perfect, wasn't it? Didn't line up the drilling in the collar, just there, look, with the drilling on the shaft, then, well, you wouldn't really get too much oil supply, would you? To that bush. Be a bit of a problem. So, when you put this on, hang on a minute, I've got to work out where it is again. It's all very tight in front of the camera. There we are, look, so it's just to the right of that little lug. So it should be about there. Yes, there we are, look. If you didn't put it on in that orientation, then the oil that's been fed through that shaft to oil that bush wouldn't actually make it to the bush, would it? And it would cause this problem. Now, I don't think that's the case this time around because the gasket on the casing here would look pretty old. It doesn't look like anybody's been in this gearbox for a very long time. So I, I don't think that was the issue. But, you know, be aware if you're putting this thing back together, make sure you line up the oil holes. Otherwise, <laughs> you'd be doing it all over again. Right. Think now. <laughs> I don't know if I can get it off or not. Not with a camera in the way. You guys have to step back a little bit. Sorry. There you go. See, it's real tight on that shaft, isn't it? There we go. Okay, I think the next job is to see if we... Oh, you can even see the metal now. Look in there. All built up. So what's happened is this gear has been spinning at a different speed to the collar, obviously it's been a different gear. Now the guy said he was in high ratio when it, when it seized up on him, or it stopped. So it's been, there's been a speed differential between the collar and the gear. And without any lubrication, it's created, there's been a high amount of friction, which has created a lot of heat. That will cause the collar to expand and get even tighter on the gear, which, you know, it's a downward spiral. The tighter it gets, the more friction there is. And it's basically welded by the looks of it, that collar to the gear, and that's exactly the same problem we had on Ben's uh, Warrior 350. It'd been in storage for a couple of years, not really used it much, and we usually stand, we used to stand them on end when they were in storage to save a bit of space. And uh, the gear was way out, way above the the line of the gearbox oil. Anyway, he jumped on it like an idiot, rode it around the field really fast, and of course there wasn't enough oil between the collar and the gear. And the same thing happened. It basically, you know, effectively, mechanically, made the gear part of the shaft. And that shouldn't be the case. It should only be linked to the shaft when it's actually 
engaged, whereas in this case it's locked to the shaft all the time. Okay, I'm going to stick this in the press and see if I can push that inner collar out. We'll give it a go. <clears throat> right, so we found a socket which will just fit around the outside of the gear and allow that collar to go down inside the socket. So hopefully that's going to work. And then we found an old, what's this one? Silver line socket, which is basically just fits on the inside. Now my main concern, I mean, obviously this is scrap, you'd have to buy a new one and a new collar, but just for shits and giggles, as Eric would say, I'm just gonna see if we can push it out. Who knows? I'll give it a go, nothing to lose. And it all could go tragically wrong, which makes a great video. All right, let's see what happens. I'm gonna wear a bit of a face, I'm gonna put a face mask on, because if this gear does decide to let go, It'll be like a little hand grenade going off, unfortunately. And there'll be shrapnel all over the workshop. So we'll just get it tensioned up. There we go. Right. Time for a mask. Jeez. Okay. <laughs> Changes your voice, doesn't it? I'm ready. Are you ready? Let's see what happens. We'll put a bit of spray in there as well, that might just help to break it free. Here's hoping. WD-40, here we go. Right. Now this is a 12 ton press, so hopefully. Make sure it's all still true. Jeez. Things I do. There's a fair bit of pressure on it. Jeez! Oh my word. Uh, well, it looks like it gave up. Super. Right. Back to the bench. Golly, that was fun, wasn't it? I wasn't quite sure what was going to happen, whether I was going to break my sockets or, or what. But looking at this, we can see now. And it took a fair bit to get it out. I thought the gear was actually going to break. But you can see where it's all where it's welded. Basically, there's been no lubrication around this area here, and it's this collar has welded itself due to the heat to the inside of the gear. I mean, look at this. There's there's still chunks of it stuck on there, all around there. Look. So, I am very very confident we have found the problem with this transfer box gearbox. The transmission issue, I think. Although, to be honest, what the cust the customer complaint was pretty damned ambiguous. Okay, well, what I'm going to do is give that a bit of a clean up and give that a bit of a clean up so that it actually does again slip, and then we can rebuild it, put the, all the gears back in on the transfer box, and just see if we can get the low, the high, and the super low. Ta-da! Well, we used the uh, little flap disc on the grinder for this one and I chucked this one in the lathe and just managed to just get out some of the some of the sort of welded material. So now it goes in from the back there, look. Oh yeah, it's doing what it should do. So, a little bit of oil just on there. It's only rough and ready, this people, just to prove a concept. There we go. Stick that in there. Oh, it's like a new one. I've run for a thousand years like that, won't it? No, I'm not going to run it like that. I doubt the rest of the quad bike anyway. Okay, right. Stick a bit more around there, look. Cool. 
Okay, time to put it back together. Just the transfer box, obviously. Oakley Dockley. So we may as well stick that one on first. It goes on there like that. Oh, look, it's even turning on its own now. In fact, let's just do this properly. Let's align the little oil hole. Not that it's going to make any difference, but you know we'll we'll feel so much better by doing that, won't we? Hey, it's assuming it's going to go back on again. We haven't munched it up too much. Oh, <laughs> where's my hammer? People are going to cringe again. Oh yes. Punch. We have a punch. Now it shouldn't be tight like this, it's just that it's knackered. There we go. Right, as you see, look, it comes off. It's great, it spins independently to the shaft, which is exactly what should happen. Okay, so, what's next? See, at the moment we've got no drive, you see, look. Turn that shaft. In fact, I can even turn it from the clutch input, look. And it doesn't transfer any drive anymore. I've put my finger on there, look. Pretty good, and that would have been driven before. Okay, so what's next? Oh, we'll stick this in. Now, big screwdriver. Right, so we've got the gear selector thingy-majig. Drum. So we'll just stick that in there. Fantastic, maybe we'll stick it in the middle setting. That might help, there we go. Right, so let's get, let's get this one put on. Like I say, I've labelled everything up now, just to make life a bit easier. Okay. Now, with these selector forks, you've got to put the fork in position, and then put the rod through. There we go. Now, I know there should be a circlip. Oh, should we put it on? No, because it was a tight fit. I think. Oh, shit, yeah, I want to put it on. Bollocks. Okay. Because the gear actually floats around now, doesn't it? Okay, so that goes down there. And then, hopefully I can get this one on. Are you going to snap in? Yes, you are. Top circlip, well done. Obviously trying to help me here. Right, that goes in there like that. And then this one. It does. It goes on. Very hard to see with the camera in the way. There we go. You can do it. There we are. Almost. Yes. That's it. Cool. Right, what's next? Okay. Let's put this now. This is the, the outer two gears are for low. So we'll stick those. Oh hang on, hang on, hang on, you're jumping the gun again, Mr. Young. A little bit of oil, just, you know, not that you have to for this job, because it's all going to go scrap. That one goes on there, thrust washer, and now that one on there, there we go, thrust washer. And this is the low gear driven, and that just pops on there like that. So happy. Okay, now one more thing. Rather than you using mole grips, I reckon I can just use this that came from the actual clutch side. It's the same spline, so we're just going to stick that on there. I did mark it out best place for it. 
and we'll stick the pinch bolt in. There we go. Right, so at the moment, I'll just bring you up. I've marked the three positions. So that lever there, this one, at the moment we're in low. And if we move the lever this way, it'll be in super low. Move it to the right, it'll be in high ratio. Okay, now I just want to position the camera so you can really see what's going on. Bear with me. Okay, so we've got the rear gear down here. This is, this is the drive. This is the output from the main gearbox just behind here. So this is these, both these two gears are drive gears. So at the moment, the selector fork uh, is in the position where it's engaging the low drive gear, and that's going to transmit drive down to the pinion into the into the diff basically well, it's not a diff but you know what I mean so we've got at the moment if I move the lever only just in shot if I move it that way it will go into super low and we should see the shift fork move across and engage that rear gear remember that that was the problematic one now just before we do that to confirm we've now got uh, movement I can now turn the gearbox and we don't have mechanical lock remember yesterday it was jammed wasn't it perfect okay right let's see if we can move into super low now we know super low worked because essentially it was always engaged wasn't it okay so we get hold of the lever and I'm going to just going to rotate the thing as I do it because that's how gearboxes work Jesus, stuff all in the way. Holy gosh. Now, I'm going to just give it a little bit of poke. There we go. Still a bit stiff. Okay. Okay, so we're in super low now. I just want to run through uh, the, the drive train, basically, of how the drive is being transmitted from the output shaft of the gearbox into the final drive, the diff at the back. So the drive is coming in via this shaft. This shaft is now locked to the super low drive gear at the back here, the one that we fixed, or temporarily fixed. And then it's going out onto this idler gear. It's driving this one. So this would be the driven. And then it's, it, obviously this is all one piece. So it's now coming out. It's traveling along this shaft to here. This is again a drive gear. And now it's driving this one. This one is, is sorry Torchy, this gear here, I just pull it off you can see that the the dogs are not engaged they're set back so this gear is free to idle spin on the shaft just line things up there we go okay so don't think that this gear is linked to the shaft in actual fact if I'm a pen you'll be able to see that when we turn it so I'll put a line on the shaft and a line on the gear and you'll see that they will move independently okay so we've got the drive coming into here and this one then is driving this gear here and then it's going through into the final drive now this gear again is free to spin on the shaft but this time the selector fork is towards us so these dogs are engaged these dogs are engaged on the back of the gear. So we'll put that back on there again. We've got to give it a, a jiggle to engage it. There we go. So we're now fully engaged. So the drive's coming in here, to here, to here, through this gear, into this gear, and out into the final drive. So we've got basically, in super low, we've got a double reduction because we're using this idler gear here. It's bloody cool. Right, so we're just going to turn that so it drops in. There we go. Right. Now, what I'd like to do is measure the actual reduction. Now, we don't know what ratio the actual transmission's in, but it doesn't matter because it's not going to change. But we're just going to see how much difference there is between super low, low, and high. And we'll go through each of the drive trends for each one. Right. So we'll go across here. Bring you down a little bit. 
So what I've done is I've put the clutch basket back on so I can turn the input shaft into the gearbox and I'll count the number of turns in and then we'll see how many turns it is for one revolution of that one. Now, am I going the right way? Are we going forwards or backwards? We are. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. Golly. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Where are we at now? Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Holy moly. 21, 22, 23, 4, 5, 26, 27, 28, 30, 31, 32, 33. Ooh, are we there? Oh, we've gone too far. We'll go back one. 32. Wow. 1 to 32 ratio. That's fantastic. Now, don't forget, that's the entire reduction from the input of the gearbox, just around here. This is the input shaft going into the gearbox. And that's the reduction all the way through the main gearbox, through the transfer box in super low, through the pinion and crown wheel to the uh, the output so the full reduction is uh, one is 32 to 1 the only additional reduction from crankshaft speed is the primary drive remember we had a a gear here onto the back of the clutch there's a, another ratio there but we're not worried about that okay right so 32 to 1 i'm going to write that down Huckley duckley, right, the next job is to engage low ratio. So I'm just going to rotate the gearbox a bit as we move that across. And we're not quite in yet. There we are, we're in now. And we are engaged. We can see that the dogs here have fully engaged. The selector forks come across and engage the back of the gear. So we're now disengaged from the super low and we're now in low. Okay, we're going to do some more ratio. Oh, hang on. We do a drivetrain, don't we? So the drive comes in again through this shaft. Here, look. This gear is now locked to the shaft. And it goes straight down to this gear here. Bring you back a little bit. There we go, look. So it comes in. This is the drive. This is the driven. And this gear is still... The selector fork is still engaging the dogs on the back of this gear. So now it goes straight through into the final drive via the shaft. So essentially, all that's happened now is we're not utilizing this idler gear. Cool, okay, well, we're still lined up on the, uh, on the diff, so we'll take you down a bit and you can count how many, well, you let me know when we get all the way around. That's the important thing. Okay, right, I've lined up. Are we going the right way? We should be. Not sure. So look. Yes. One. Two. That's three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Well, that's ten turns. Where are we at? Oh yeah, keep going. 11, 12, 13, that's 14. Oh, nearly there. 15. Oh, a fraction more, maybe a half. Right, that's a half. Oh, back a little bit. I think we'll call it 15. Yeah, let's call that 15. So now, 15 to 1 through the whole gearbox. That's a hell of a difference. Right, so low was 15 to 1. Super low, previously 32 to 1. Let's find out what high is. Right, first job, we have to engage high ratio. 
So we need to move this lever, <laughs> this temporary lever, one more click that way to about this position here on the casing. So it's always good to be turning the gearbox when you try to find select things. There we go. So we're in, we're definitely locked in there. Look, we can see if we come around that the detent is in the groove. We're definitely fully engaged into low, sorry, into high ratio. So what's happened? Well, the top selector fork is still engaging the dogs on this gear. The only thing that changed, and get you brought round a bit. There we go, look. What's changed now is this selector fork here has disengaged the outer gear and it's now engaged the inner gear to the shaft. Okay, so how's the drive getting into the final drive? Well, let's take a look. This is cool. Okay, are you ready for this? Right, hold on. So the drive's coming in on the output shaft of the gearbox, this shaft here, and it's now locked in to this gear here. Now, it can't transfer down to the pinion via this bottom gear here because it's disengaged. It's just spinning on the shaft. It's not connected to the final drive. So it has to be driving this, this idler shaft. So this, this time round, in high, the idler shaft is working in the opposite direction. The drive's coming in on the small gear and going out on the large gear and it's going through that rear gear here that, used, that, that does super low when it's engaged and then that is driving the rear gear. So we'll just give you a bit of a close up down there. You can see that it's, it's in mesh obviously, we, we saw it earlier on when I put it all together. It's in mesh down there and that rear gear is now locked to the shaft via the dogs. So that's how we get high ratio. This is cool. I do like working things out. Okay, so high ratio, you need to count the turns. Let's just get it lined up again. There we go. Are we lined up at your side? We are. Right, off we go. One, two, three, four. That's four. Oh, keep going. Five, six, so that's seven turns of the input. Eight, nine, that's ten. Oh, we're not far off. Eleven, that's twelve turns. And we need to go back a little bit. That's back to 11. What are we on? Yes, perfect. Let's write that down. So in high, we got 11 to 1. Look at the differences. Now, obviously, we don't know what gear the main gearbox is in, but it still shows us there's a huge difference in the reduction ratios available using that transfer box. Bloody good. So there you go. We did it. We found the problem with the transmission. And we worked out how the transfer box side of things works. How the drive is provided. The three different ratios are provided with these gears. And we found the fault of poor lubrication. I suppose we should just check reverse, shouldn't we? Just for shits and giggles. So we'll just line that back up again. Now, we don't need this anymore. We'll leave it in low. I wonder if it will fit on there. It might do. Okay. I'm not sure how reverse works on this thing, so... Oh, that sounded pretty positive, didn't it? Right, that's reverse. And we appear to have no drive at all. <laughs> Let's put it back to where it was. Drive. No drive. Drive. No drive. Oh, hang on, it's trying. Oh, 
Golly, we may have a problem with reverse as well. Maybe reverse isn't available in super low. But how would it know it's in super low? Anyway. Okay, that brings us to the end of this video. Now, there's still some work to do on this engine. We're going to pull the, the actual five-speed gearbox apart. We may have a problem with reverse. We just don't know. It doesn't seem to be working, does it? Anyway, my apologies. This will have been an extremely long video. I don't know what the limit is on YouTube, but I'm probably getting pretty close to it. Yes, it probably should have been a few different videos, but hey, once you get going, you just want to keep going, don't you? And what have we found? Well, we found that the issue was a problem of lubrication. Um, the, obviously, the, there's three and a half litres of oil, engine oil, in this gearbox and, and supplying the crankshaft and the gears and so on. But as that oil level gets lower, if it hadn't been topped up or it's had a bit of a leak, then, of course, this gear right at the top is going to be getting less and less lubrication. Um, sure, it should be getting you know, pump-fed, but it, for whatever reason, there's clear signs that there was no lubrication going on and it seized that collar to the, to the actual gear itself. So, be aware that that kind of stuff can go wrong. And it's not always that obvious. It wasn't that obvious to me straight away. I had to go away and have a little think about it, have a sleep, wake up, and then go, aha, I wonder if. And you'll have that moment yourself, probably. Okay, well, there's going to be another video where we're actually going to split the casings. I'm going to have to make a, a puller to get this flywheel off. And then we can get in there and take a look at the five-speed transmission and the final drive, which is all housed inside here. Uh, hopefully, you found this video interesting and helpful. And if you did, why not subscribe to the channel? You can click on the subscribe button. You'll see a little gear icon turn up. Click on the gear icon, and then you can tick the box and turn on notifications. You'll also find me on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Feel free to communicate through any of those portals. Uh, there is my email address down the bottom as well. So flick me an email if you've had any weird and wonderful experiences. Uh, if you've got any questions as well, I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, first point of contact, though, if you don't mind, through the comments here on this video, if it relates to this particular you know, video. Uh, there's also a Patreon page. Drop onto that if you like, and uh, you'll find history of the channel on there, uh, all the various profiles of the Tool Girls, and, uh, of course, you can become a patron to the channel as well. And We do get a few donations through, and whatever comes through is spent on the channel, uh, buying resources, tools, whatever, to bring you guys and girls, more videos. Okay, crew, I've got a ton of work to do now. Um, I've got a, an RRV to service. I've got a little 90cc quad bike to get up and running. And, and I also want to do some more to the, the carport out the front. And I've got the rest of today, being Saturday, about half a day left, and all of tomorrow. It's going to be push, you know, really pushing it to get it all done. Anyway, until next time, cheers, over and out. Oh! <laughs> 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 <laughs>